So, Jeff, though, should I pick um, different canvas and things for the viewers? Because right now, I'm logged into the webinar, but I think it's using yeah, so my computer. So, I don't want people to connect the thing to oh, this. Okay. I'm going to need to know the. Uh, do you want me to bring this over there? Okay. Okay. It is eight three five seven four two nine two seven one four. Great question. Let's see. Yes, nine four six one eight six. Recording in progress. Yes, I. I should have mentioned that before. And also that we're not using that mic. Okay. okay, but it is no. About that. No, no, no. This I should not be doing this. Is what I'm going to say. There we go. There. Association and we are recording this channel. Surprise. Um, you can find this presentation as well as uh, many of the other people that we have working waterfront on our website at makingfisherman.org. That actually worked out for a nice little plug. Um, so I'm going to introduce myself quickly and then I'm going to let the panel introduce themselves. Um, thank you for the Main Coast Heritage Trust for this awesome space and for everybody coming. Uh, so the Main Coast Fishermen's Association, I don't know how familiar everybody is, we're the blue building on Pleasant Street across from Modern Past. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I could say Dunkin' Donuts, but that's not quite right. You know, I can see Dunkin' from my office. Um, our mission is to restore the fisheries in the Gulf of Maine and sustain Maine's fishing communities for future generations. Our organization was founded in 2006 by ground fish fishermen out of Port Clyde. But since that time, um, our organization has grown quite a bit and we now work with um, all of Maine's fisheries all along the coast of Maine. And we even work with some fishermen out of New Hampshire and Massachusetts. So ground fish, uh, would like I said, is um, we were founded by ground fish fishermen, is species like haddock, hake, pollock, and cod. Um, but we work on a lot of programs. My programs are actually fishermen wellness and working waterfront, which is why I'm the moderator of this. Um, we also have a program called Fishermen Feeding Mainers, uh, where we're able to purchase fish directly from Maine fishermen. Uh, we work with local processors to cut the fish and then donate it to uh, food pantries, Good Shepherd Food Bank, and um, in the school system, and our Maine Coast Monkfish Stew, which you can try in the back. Um, proceeds from the sales of that go right back into the Fisherman Feeding Mainers program, and the monkfish is also from local fishermen. So please give it a shot. Let us know what you think. We think it's pretty delicious, um, and you can find where to um, buy it on our website as well. You can buy it in Morning Glory. You can yeah. buy it in Morning Glory. It's in Hannaford. <laughs> um, so, like I said, I'm going to let everybody sort of introduce themselves. Tonight's supposed to be fun, first of all, and then somewhat informal. So I obviously have questions. If you have any clarifying questions or thoughts, you know, please feel free to just sort of get my attention and we'll try to have a nice conversation and talk about um, the waterfront and why it's important and a whole bunch of stuff. So. I'm Angela Twitchell. I'm the executive director of the Brunswick Topsom Land Trust, which is the local land trust here in the Brunswick Topsom area. We were founded in 1985 and we've been conserving land in the towns of Brunswick, Topsom, and Bowdoin since then. Um, we also spend a lot of um, 
effort connecting people to the land and water. So we run a lot of programs. Uh, many of you are probably familiar with Crystal Spring Farm. Um, that's sort of our signature property where we run a farmer's market um, and community garden and um, connect people to the land. We also, um, one of our primary focus areas for conservation is our waters and protecting buffers to our bays and rivers and streams, um, it, making sure that the water quality remains um, excellent as it has been historically and ensuring that access to the waters for fishermen, shelf fishermen and um, just all of the people of the area um, that they have access to our waters. So I've been in this role since 2008, and I was on the board before that and since the late 90s. So I've been doing this work for a long time. I really love um, this area. We're really fortunate to have such great natural resources, and I'm happy to be um, at the part in conserving them. We're supported by um, about 1,100 members. That's how we're able to do our work. Many of you in the room I recognize, so thank you for your support. Um, Follow that. All right. My name is Marco Malindi, and I am uh, here with the Rivers and Coastal Waters Commission, so the Brunswick Rivers and Coastal Waters Commission. I've been on that commission for maybe six years. I've been chaired for the last four years, and the uh, and that organization really was uh, originated maybe 2014 as part of. It came from the Harbor Management Plan, which acknowledged a need for uh, a commission to oversee the implementation of the Harbor Management Plan and then provide the town of Brunswick a continuous discussion of the resources and management, best management practices. Um, and I'm also on the uh, Marine Resources Committee for maybe seven years now. And that deals with uh, the harvest of shellfish in Brunswick. So that's one of the uh, marine resources that the town actually has control over as opposed to the state level. And so we deal with providing assessments of the shellfish population and the health of the mudflats. Uh, and how many, how many licenses that we can justify given the current state of the population. Um, and then anything that sort of touches that. So access, Source pollution, anything that we think is an issue that might intersect with the resource, uh, we provide a platform to talk about it. I'm also on the, the Mayor Brook. I might be mixing up that acronym, um, but again, looking at Mayor Brook because it all eventually ends up. Okay, so. Okay. Um, my name is Elen. Uh, Marsh Harrower. I am the third generation of Pulse Marina. And if I know a lot of you here, but if you have not been down to Pulse Marina or don't know what we are, it's primarily a recreational uh, marina. We have 140 moorings. Um, we're the only deep water access in Casco Bay, and we're the only fuel service in northern Casco Bay. So some would probably say we're not a working waterfront because we're not in the fishing industry. But I would like to think that a modern definition of a working waterfront would include uh, marinas. And we do our best to service our fellow fishermen and lobstermen and harvesters um, in, the, in the bay, however, you know, best that we can. So, but we primarily, I would say primarily service the active recreational boaters and fishermen uh, in the bay. So we've been there for 77 years. So it's, it's quite a unique little spot. So if you've never been down, come on down. You don't have to have a mooring there. You can just come down and enjoy the view. Awesome. And I'm Max Burtis. I'm a oyster farmer and clam digger. I've been a clammer in Brunswick for eight years now. And, um, started in the student program and just recently transitioned into the commercial license. And I own an oyster farm on the New Meadows River with my father. Um, we've had that operation for four years now. So yeah, I'm here. I'm also on the 
Human Resource Committee in the uh, Brunswick, and I just appointed to that position. So um, I'm excited, <laughs> excited for that, and um, yeah, also excited to share my thoughts on the Newark waterfront. The name of the oyster? Alberta Farms. my job. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I think actually one of the best places to start since we're talking about the waterfront is defining what we're talking about. So um, I'm going to ask the panel and Max, maybe we can start with you and work our way down this way. What does the working waterfront mean to you? And also, what does it mean specifically? What is working waterfront? The, the first couple of things that, that come to my mind um, is access and infrastructure. So you know, how do you get to the water? Um, so where do you, are, you, um, where you pull up your, with your boat? Um, you know, how do you access the water there? And then you know, the infrastructure that's there, where we, maybe it's fuel, maybe it's um, a uh, crane to unload things from your boat. Back to pick up. Um, yeah, those are the things that, that come to mind. What, is, what does it working waterfront mean? I think there's, I don't know, I think when I think of the working waterfront, I mean, I think of anybody that, I think it's really the essence of Maine, really, to me, is that it's, you know, the people with this incredible work ethic. And it's the character, I think. It's not just it's not just the work, but it's the character of the people of Maine. Um, and I think it's it's part of our scenery, it's part of our tradition, but it's also a huge part of our tourism. So when I think of the working waterfront, I think it's not just the people that work there, but it's the people that come to see the work going on there. I think it's it's um two things. It's, it's the physical infrastructure necessary to support the fishery, but it's also a, a bunch of our, our history and identity. So I didn't grow up along the coast in Maine. I was a little further inland, so I didn't get on the water as much as I liked to, but I had a very vivid image of what the, you know, the working waterfront and the Maine coast fishermen were like. And, and so I, I had a very kind of clear image of what that was. And I think it's a, um, it's a big part of uh, our identity, and so it's it, it's something that um, has evolved and changed. I think it's the obvious pressures, of real estate value, and petition for waterfront access have uh, uh, made things difficult for the working waterfront. But for me, it's 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 really too. It's that's the, the iconic tourist vision I mentioned. But then it's also a, a very dense. Actual working waterfront, hard work base that I think is, you know, a lot of us uh, have this sort of romantic view of. For you, how does like a land trust think about the working waterfront? Well, for me, I feel like it's really important, as you all said, the character of Maine. When we uh, think of Maine, oftentimes we think of the iconic landscapes along the coast. Um, and part of Part of that character and one of the greatest assets of the state of Maine is the coast and the working waterfront. And as a land trust, it's really important that we are um, conserving that so that it can be used by all people, right? It's really, um, it scares me a lot. And part of the reason I do this work is that if the coast is brought up only by people who are wealthy enough to afford really high real estate prices. So Part of what land trusts do and through conserving public land, so land so the public can use it and also um, that it can be used for public values like working waterfront or access for canoeers or fishermen. Um, that's what I feel like <coughs> trust to see that it's um, the access to one of the greatest assets of the state of Maine is this is actually one of my favorite questions um, that we've been asking in all of the panels. Everybody always has such sort of, nobody says the same thing and everybody has like really interesting um, aspects. One of the, my favorite answers too, and this is sort of in line with a couple of yours is like, 
uh, somebody in Freeport said, well, it's the relationships on the waterfront. And I thought that was really sort of a nice and positive way to think about things. Uh, when we think about the working waterfront for Maine Coast Fishermen's Association, we're thinking about the infrastructure necessary to do business. And that, interestingly enough, doesn't necessarily tie it specifically to the waterfront even. So for a commercial fisherman, they might be thinking about the mooring where they keep their boat, the wharf where they land their catch, and then potentially the trucks that distribute the product, the bait, ice, fuel necessary for doing their business. So they think about it similar to how someone in agriculture might think about a food system. The working waterfront is the system in which the seafood sort of goes along. Um, so uh, I hope you guys don't mind a little interaction. Does anybody in the audience have anything that they want to add in regards to how they feel about or think about the working waterfront? No pressure. And you can always answer later, but I want to keep everybody engaged. Do you have any thoughts? I just, do you know the number? <laughs> Yeah, I have, I have a lot of thoughts. I didn't ask, none of you. You should here. never <laughs> ask that. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't know. You know that. What's your number? No, no I'm, I was wondering if you knew the number of miles of defined working waterfront. It's um, not been updated in a very long time. According to the Island Institute, there's 20 miles of coastline, of which 16 is specifically for commercial fishing. But that's been a while. So we don't know if that's still accurate. And it didn't take into consideration aquaculture, so. Right. Just curious whether it includes the riverfront as well as the ocean. So not for our organization, but yes, it does. We work with Maine Marine Trades Association quite a bit, um, and they work with freshwater um, marine businesses. And so there are aspects of working waterfront that are on freshwaters like lakes and rivers. Absolutely. Do you want to add anything? I think I had read a figure that was might have been on the main Sea Grant page where it was approaching 25 miles, but so so not much more considering the length of our coastline. Mm -hmm. And the other thing I wanted to say about the working waterfront question. So that's a technical definition of what it's working waterfront. For growing up, I always just assumed it was all working waterfront, like anywhere there's coastline or shellfish resource, I mean, that's a working waterfront. And so for me, in my mind, that's what the working waterfront is. It is not 20 miles away. Yeah. Absolutely, and I think that that's a really important point to consider as we go into the future, right? Like business on the waterfront is important. And as you had mentioned mm -hmm. too, if we have new residents or a growing population on the coast and some of that business on the waterfront is transformed, mm -hmm. That makes it difficult for commercial fishing businesses, for marinas, for boat yards, for everybody. And so having a more expansive definition of working waterfront is important. But also in conversations like this, it's nice to just talk about defining it because that's how we start to identify solutions and communicate better about it. I think as far as like, when you talk about working waterfront, you might have one face to the business, but that business services several different versions of the working waterfront, you know, for us coming, you know, like coming through the marina, we have mechanics, mm -hmm. you know, that go out and work on the boats. We have, you know, riggers um, that go out to check rigging. We have people that are building cottages on the islands, you know, are those considered working waterfront, you know, people that are, you know, working on, you know, trees or whatever on the waterfront, um, you know, and then, and then we do have obviously the, um, you know, the harvesters or whatever that would come in, you know, in and out through us, that would be more of your traditional. But I mean, I think we're front, our, and a lot of people go through our area to get to the water to do their job. Absolutely, absolutely. So um, let me look at our questions. So let's talk about working waterfront and planning. Um, I'm gonna start with you, Angela. So when you're thinking about planning for the long-term with the land trust and things like that, how do you prioritize waterfront and conservation? Um, <coughs> when we do our conservation planning, um, when we're picking up the waterfront, we're looking always back from the waterfront. So for the work that we do, it's really important to protect a buffer. That helps with water quality, but it also, where we have our <coughs> marshes, it allows for migration of marshes, which we now have talked about. So 
our definition of planning for conservation of waterfront isn't always on the water. Uh, and as someone said, uh, you know, conserving land along the streams is really important because streams and rivers all goes out into the bays. Um, so it's sort of expansive, our definition of conservation planning around waterfront. And we're really lucky in Maine that we, um, the state, as well as the federal government and statewide organizations like Bank Coast Heritage Trust, um, and the Nature Conservancy do a lot of mapping. We have a lot of resources to identify the priority areas um, to conserve, um, to help ensure the waterfront um, remains uh, open for working and also that the waters remain clean and healthy. Uh, so that's sort of the perspective that we take. We carefully look at all the resources, we prioritize our work, we proactively go out and talk to landowners um, and folks in the community to make sure that we conserve the most and I think that's so important too, right? Like everything on land, no matter how far back, potentially ends up in the ocean. So there yeah. needs to be some planning. Marco, would you agree? And how do you kind of consider that? So I, I, I do agree. And so again, we get, get back to what people's different opinions of working waterfront is and trying to get a group to, to plan for that. And we can't even agree on what the health rise is going to be or doesn't. So there's challenges there. And in terms of planning too, there, there, there are some folks that like the working waterfront more than others. And so meeting priority. And also when you look at like for a big concern of projects, which is the selfish uh, resource, that's primarily harvesters are in the intertidal and that's uh, the same set of land now has two legally acted Interests. So the owner has got property rights, but the harvester has got property rights. People have fishing rights, not just commercial fishing rights. And so we've got the same piece of land that's got two sets of priorities. So planning has really got to be like I think last night at the Marine Resources Committee, we were talking about the amount of money that Brunswick spends on the shellfish. And the amount of money that comes in, fees and stuff like that. But it's really just a small portion of the benefit. Yeah, it's, I think last year, $8 million in potential benefit for Brunswick, and before that, 10 or 12 years ago. Mm -hmm. So there's a big sort of investment you get from the planning. Not everybody is. Ellen, do you have anything to add about planning for? Well, my planning is a little bit different than their planning. My planning is, um, it was funny when you guys were talking, I'm like, ooh, I missed the mark on this. <laughs> 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 my planning is more about how to remain part of, how to remain a working That's waterfront. Yeah. yeah. As a commercial business, it's like, how do you modernize and reinvest in your business to keep up with the changes that go on, whether it's technology, whether it's size of equipment, changes in the materials that things are made out of, and the process it takes, and this is near and dear to my heart right now, some of you know that, um, the long process that it takes to make these reinvestments in your business. And how, how early do you need to start the process before it ends up being emergent, you know? And so, you know, for us, it's, Keeping on top of what's going on in, you know, in that kind of marina industry, what other people are using, what are they putting under their docks? What are they, what are they building their wharves out of? Um, you know, when do you sign up? When you start getting permits for stuff. Um, and then that is all usually poked at by some of those people that own the property nearby you. So that was, I was going to have a follow-up question for you, which is, do you, are you finding some of that planning becoming more difficult in the past few years? Yeah, we're on, I don't know if you know this, um, some, I know some other people do, but we're on year two, solid year two of trying to get a replaced bulkhead. And without the bulkhead, we don't have a business. And it has been a, I think it's been quite a struggle. Um, I think Unfortunately, the town, 
the town has put in a lot of extra time on it, um, which I'm super grateful for. I think the state has put in a lot of extra time on it, which also I'm very grateful for. But it, the process is, you know, it is still, you know, we don't have the building permit yet. And with that storm in December, it, it offered a whole different element that we weren't prepared for. So now part of our planning is not just to replace that, but to get it to where it's high enough. What's the ball so, It's like, if you were to if you were to come to a marina or to a, a co-op, a lobster co-op or something, you're like we have a bulkhead, which is a solid piece of crib work that you attach your floats and your docks to. So we have our store and then we have the bulkhead and then we have the floats. So the bulkhead, there's crane that sits on that. There's a gas tank that sits on that. So it's a major structure. Without that, you don't have anything else. So that's the. Yeah, that's the term that we have to use on permits is bulkhead. So I think most people would call it a wharf, but, but the bulkhead is the, the formal term. So anyway, so I don't know if I went. No, that's that's perfect. <laughs> so for, for you, same kind of question. Can you talk about how diversification of your business is important for planning in your own life as well as your business and the working waterfront? Yeah, definitely. Um, so yeah, one of the reasons why I started oyster farming was to diversify. Um, <laughs> when I first started digging clams, we, there wasn't a lot of resource there in, in 2014. Um, and you know, things go up and down. Um, and so I wanted to have something to do during high tide that could make me money and you know I can invest some time and money in and hopefully get a stabilize my my income a little bit um and yeah i mean as we think about you know how working waterfront can aid that diversification um i really think to some of the bottlenecks that i see in the aquaculture industry um where, where working waterfront could, could help you know diversify um so, I mean, for example, like deep water access is pretty hard to come by in the town of Brunswick. Um, and that's like a, you know, what is really important for um, you know, an aquaculture company where you might have employees and you're trying to schedule, but the time that you have to start work changes every day and because of the tide, and then you're trying to schedule pickups or, or, or drop offs of materials or you know, selling oysters and, and what have you. And it gets a little crazy when you don't have um, access to the water all day. Um, and that's something that you don't necessarily see with clamming because it is a tidal industry and, and um, you schedule it as the tides. So, um, you know, that's just something I, I think about when I think about diversification and, you know, trying to do some aquaculture and wild fishery. Um, you know, it, would, it would help to have water access, all tide access. Did we have a question in the chat? I do. So um, from the chat, uh, question, what are the most important things the town of Brunswick can do through ordinances, zoning, or regulations to preserve access to the coast in our town by people, access in our town by people making their living from fishing? That's so. a big question. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And you want to take that? Does anybody, <laughs> does anybody I mean, Marco and Dan, between the two committees, I feel right. like we can. So again, a, a complicated topic because there are competing priorities for sure. Right. But um, again, the economy of development. Heavy. So to compete with so it really takes a community commitment to like this is important to us. So I, I think years ago, I can't remember many years ago, statewide Maine invested the value was going up. The waterfront the taxes you were paying were were based on the development value of the land, not direct. Time ago, it made a huge 
huge difference, but in that amount of time, values have gone up so much more that it's, it's even harder to set aside land. So I know that there have been global trying to catalog, I think Manamet's done that, they're trying to catalog the, the current local access, and lost access to see where we really lost that. Um, so that's a good first step. First of all, get a handle on what we actually have so that we can protect those access points and then look at access points lost or other potential access points and use something like or conservation or an access easement that would allow you to, to get the rights to cross that property without access to the a number of different tools in terms of ordinances. Boy, that's know what you could do with a number of ordinances because you can't just say like anybody can walk across property access i mean it's it's just not i don't know that an ordinance can do that you can support the fisheries you can support landowners but in the end access is what it is correct access and that's really flimsy especially here in brunswick not only brunswick but i think Given our 70 miles of coastline, how much? Where's our public access percentage of that 70? And one last mention I, I've traveled around a little bit and lived in coastal communities, not in Maine, where they don't have the, the, the private intertidal and the shift of just the whole culture of the community is, is shifted. I've lived in number of places where anybody could just walk down the end of the street and you pop out on a, a municipal set of stairs that takes you right down to the front and it's just the, the, the benefits to the community are huge in terms of not just creation but health and wellness sanity and it's just it's it's stark coming back to me born and raised here i left for a few years i didn't realize so i think it's having value that, prioritize it more. And so preserving access when we can, we can deal with that. And then consulting with the actual community, what do you need to make sense rather than having us? Mark Bowman, I'm going to take on a little bit from the Zoom audience and say that they're having trouble hearing your voice. So I think in general, if everyone could speak up, but yeah, that would be great. You uh, brought up something too, the, the land value. The other challenge, I think, um, I'm also a fishing family. I, I live in Harpswell, is just the cost of living. And, you know, I have kids and the, they're going to have to work pretty hard if they want to buy a house in Harpswell right now <laughs> and into the future. And for Land harvesters, um, especially, but anybody that want, that uses the working waterfront as part of their business, if you can't live in the town, you can't vote. Determine the waiver of municipal issues that can impact the waterfront. We have a real challenge on our hands. A uh, follow-up question for you, if I could, then. So, difference between Brunswick and Harpswell, the lot the minimum lot size. So, Brunswick, I think, is three acres. You're gonna ask me about lot sizes. I have no, no idea. Well, I mean, so, so it's, so it's, oh, it's five bucks out of the village. I think, right, okay. Yeah. Okay. So I think the idea was the lot size, yeah. less development among the house, but what that's done, of course, now you have a bigger piece of property that costs a lot more money. Yeah. A, a, a smaller one that maybe grandfather. And I think in, in Harpswell that was the case. And it's just my own non expert look out there. It seems like gentrification has happened a lot faster or more in Brunswick. And I'm wondering if that isn't the reason. I don't know. I mean, there's about... there's quite a bit of gentrification using that word loosely in yeah. Harpswell too, especially when you get on the water in the summertime and look up at the houses. <laughs> they come out of nowhere and they're big. Um, so that's not you know, necessarily correct. I just didn't know if that was a strategy like that the towns yeah. could use, looking at the differences that have evolved from you know, the different policies on also communities more from each other in regards to processes and things that they've tried. Um, MCFA 
did a little bit about that when we did the state of Maine's work in waterfront report a few years ago. We sort of compared and contrasted 12 different communities. And, um, and there's lessons to be learned both in successes as well as failures. You know, like Stonington tried um, a parking ordinance because they had issues with parking. And what they found at certain times of year was the fishermen that were getting the tickets. And so they were like, oh, that's not working. <laughs> <laughs> So, you know, finding, and, th and that's another issue for Maine too. We're very seasonal. So what's going to work for us in the summertime might not work for us in the wintertime with some of those, depending on the types of ordinances that we're talking about. So um, I'm wondering, I have a challenge for our, our panelists is um, I'm wondering if you can, and it doesn't have to be, there's no right answers here. Like, can you articulate what you think might be the challenge on the working water? You want to jump in there because there's many. Yeah, I was going to say, Angela, how you start from the land um, trust perspective? From my perspective, it really follows up on the land value question. You know, particularly since COVID <coughs> you know, really raised up on a lot of people's maps from around the country um, that work remotely. Hey, Maine seems pretty nice, <laughs> and land values have really increased. We've seen um, properties sell so. <coughs> And I think we've all experienced that, but from a land conservation point, it really um, makes our work difficult because most of you probably don't know, but we don't just have money <laughs> sitting around to buy whatever land we want. We negotiate with landowners and then we have to go out and raise funds to purchase the property. So it takes a while. So we have to find landowners who want to see the land conserved and are willing to wait and not take um, you know, the highest dollar, the fastest dollar. That, um, so the raising land values and the um, really rapid selling of market, coastal water markets when they go is really challenging. And I see that into the future um, is a real challenge from my point. Definitely a big one. Anybody else thought of their biggest? Go ahead, Max. I think like um, awareness of the working waterfront and it's because the, you know, maybe hundred years ago, everyone was pretty aware of, of fishing, but um, the importance and values that are associated with it. But right now, um, all of the property changing hands so quickly, it seems that a lot of people aren't aware of the heritage and aren't aware of just the way people make a living on the water um, and the, the, the potential you know, impacts. Um, so you see a lot of people up in arms about this or that, um, you know, working waterfront related. And um, I think it's an issue of communication. Um, I think that I really liked what Harpswell did with the um, Landowner Appreciation Day, um, with the, the scuttlebutt um, the pamphlet that they handed out to kind of educate um, public about the uses of the, the working waterfront. There it is, yeah. And um, the Landowner Appreciation Day, for those who don't know about it, was where um, it was a big old a celebration for you know, the, the landowners um, in the town of Harpswell and where the, the clamors were there and they um, steamed up a bunch of clams and whatnot. And um, they ended up getting um, easements um, or you know, some from some of the landowners so that clambers could walk across their properties um, so that you know they could get access to the, the clam flats. So um, I think you know things like that. I could just put a yeah. plug in for the Brunswick Marine Resources Committee, which last night talked about that same event and a lot of support for trying to do something like that in Brunswick as well. Heard that it went over well and it, and so I think uh, that's something we probably hear more about at the Great Resources. Great, Herb is doing it again this year too in August. Super subtle butt for us. <laughs> so that's available on the table over there. Um, that was actually created in partnership. It was the Main Coast Fishermen's Association. Harpsol Heritage Land Trust, the Whole Brooks Community Foundation, the Cundy's Harbor Library, and the Harpsol Anchor worked together on that. Um, it's sort of inspired by a couple of guides that Maine Sea Grant did 
almost a decade ago. They did one in Harpswell and they did one in the Muthubek area. And um, we kind of took it to the next level. So there's information about the fisheries that happen um, around Harpswell, but also that just the fishermen in Harpswell participate in and lots of photos. There's a recipe. Um, there's a little bit of information about some of the ordinances that we have to try to protect the Gulf Maine ecosystem. Like um, there's a no pesticide use within 25 foot ordinance in Harpswell um, and just little things like that. And we are actually working with other communities that are interested. We're gonna create sort of a template guide. Um, I'm going up to Gouldsboro I think next week or the week after because they have a group of people up there that wanna do something similar. So things like the Landowner Appreciation Day, <laughs> Communication and education are definitely like really cool tools that towns can put in their toolbox to try to help sort of elevate conversations around working waterfront. And we believe that, you know, the municipalities taking ownership of that really helps define it and make it about that community. Statewide guides are helpful, but Harpswell is not Cutler, is not Stonington, is not Freeport, is not Brunswick. We all have very similar issues but they're not the same. And so if you can make something that's more tied to the community's culture and identity, I think it's gonna go a lot further than, so. I think that a group of people that are overlooked in all of this, or maybe the realtors need to step up and take some responsibility <laughs> in the education out there. I, I mean, I'm not saying this to offend anybody, but you know, it's an easy sell. Property in Maine is an easy sell, but when you buy by the boat launch, somebody probably should tell you there's going to be an airboat going out of there. <laughs> you don't take five, you know, if you don't take two hours to sit there and see what happens at that boat launch, then maybe that's your fault. Yeah. But that would have been an easy, you know, an easy, not necessarily a fix, but just some information, you know, see what happens at low tide. You know, you can't bring your boat in there at low tide. So maybe you should know that you can't build out to high tide, you know, but people don't tell you that. And when you're just buying this awesome piece of property or this house on the coast, that's what you see. You don't see the rest of it. You don't hear the lobster boats. You don't, you know, see the pogey boats. You don't, you know, that's, that's important. And I think that's a group of people that, you know, really need to, aware of how they can impact that. Great. It's been our experience that uh, a lot of real estate agents are on board with that and mm -hmm. very communicated. There's one of our very first Harpswell Working Waterfront panels. We had a real estate agent on the panel and she said that she has offered to people to spend the night in the house so that they can see and hear the activity that could potentially occur so that they weren't too scared off. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. And it would just, you know, that was probably the most valuable piece of information ever given to me buying a house was to sit in the neighborhood in the middle of the day and see who's home and who's not home. Yeah. You know, what goes on in the neighborhood. And I just can't believe that some of these, these houses that, you know, have been purchased and, and sometimes they're not, sometimes they're not new houses. Sometimes they're old family houses and new families have kind of risen to that level. And yes. sometimes they're the ones who are like, wait a minute, where did all these things come from? So, and I'm sure that's changed even a bit in the past five years. According to Atlas Van Lines, Maine was the number two most moved to state in 2020. It was number one. Oh, wow. wow. That's not small. Wow. And I think, you know, people, I've heard of houses being bought sight unseen, obviously. Yes. We're asking. So, those types of things make a difference for sure. <laughs> I heard an interesting statistic from somebody who sells real estate on the coast of Maine. He said that you can buy right now, you can buy a mansion on the coast in Maine and a share of NetJets, which is a private jet company that would fly you from New York to Maine. And you'd still save money and get there faster than if you bought a house in the Hamptons. Wow. It's happening. Yes. I think that. Yeah, <laughs> so we, don't, we don't necessarily need to go down this road, but I think that's one of the issues with the with the pandemic that you know people being able to work from home are now making West Coast and New York dollars and living in Maine, and that's new for us. Yes, Dan. I think um, when I noticed a big push in the you know, sort of the gentrification trajectory 
was when social media started to kick in. Mm -hmm. You get all of these beautiful pictures of Maine, and I mean, they just get spread. I mean, you take a picture of the sunset, and there's 10,000 people that have looked at it within 10 minutes, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so it really opened up a lot of eyes around the country because we do live, in my opinion, the best area of the country. Yeah, you know? I think it's true. We're very so. Instagrammable. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Okay, so we all agreed. Stop telling yeah. Yeah. <laughs> share photos. <laughs> I think that's actually been uh, um, the main office of tourism at their governor's conference of tourism. And I noticed that in their uh, agenda, there was a lot more discussion around sustainability in tourism and taking into consideration cultural and environmental impacts of tourism because of the changes that are happening in Maine. There's been an immense growth both in people moving here as well as awesome. We just have to figure out how to balance that. Right. I was just wondering if the panel could comment on the effect of climate change and water, sea level rise on the working waterfront and seafood industry. Absolutely. Great question. Perfect. That was a question from Zoom as well. So that is fabulous. Thank that you. That comes up every, every panel. So thank yeah. you for asking. Does anybody want to start? I can start. <laughs> The first thing that comes to, to my mind is just like how um, fast, you know, like I've seen changes just in my life. Um, and, you know, these are the, the different, you know, fisheries that we're going to have, you know, um, 50 years from now. You know, it's gonna, the fisheries are going to look different. And, you know, we're going to have to change, uh, make some serious changes to our working water from to support new fisheries, you know, more aquaculture to support, um, you know, rising sea level as well. So um, we're going to have to be pretty nimble um, and, you know, invest a lot of, you know, time and careful planning into trying to figure out how to address these changes if we're going to still support the working. I can't talk to the science of it. That is certainly not my expertise, but I mean, I can speak to the fact that yes, diversification is going to have to happen in the fisheries. I mean, I've, I've been back in Maine now for 10 years, and I, I mean, been here for years, left for about 15 years, and then came back, and I cannot believe the difference in the lobster industry in 10 years. And so, you know, that. In order for in order for everything to continue as a status quo, we're going to have to figure out some diversification. And then, as far as physical structures in these working waterfronts, I mean, it's a lot of money that's going to be put into raising these places up. You know, I mean, some of these I'm always amazed on some of the high tides that some of the the wharves in our area will be underwater, and they hadn't been underwater. And that storm in December, I have never seen anything like it. And hopefully we'll never see anything like it again, but I cannot believe how high the water was on Mayor Point, on our side of Mayor Point. And yes, it was headed right at us. So, you know, that didn't help. But boy, if there's any picture for what's to come, you know, for me, that was, that was definitely a real taste of it. I guess I would just say that a lot of people have that same sentiment, like, boy, that was a really bad storm. I hope we don't see that again. <laughs> <laughs> we, we are and probably going to be next year. <laughs> Thanks. So we've got to look a little further ahead. Water temperatures, everybody talks about that, but the size of the storms and so the structural integrity that the working waterfront um, infrastructure needs to have to sustain that is going to be bigger. We've got populations of fish that are moving north. Um, I like to complain about the green crabs, but wait 20 years, all the blue crabs will be moving green crabs. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's, it's coming whether you like it or not. Yeah. So I think we need to, in terms of planning, we need to look way beyond. Not just organisms moving around, but new diseases, harmful algae blooms. Yeah. I mean, it's it's all here, and it's just intensifying for the foreseeable future. 
And unfortunately, people really hate change. So when mm. new industries like aquaculture, for example, come to try to deal with the changes that are happening, people want it to be like it always has been and like it was when they were growing up. But we, you know, Max, you're much younger than I am. <laughs> but it's just thinking back of all of the fisheries that have changed in my lifetime. You know, 25 years ago, we would buy 25 pounds of Maine shrimp and pick some pick them with my grandmother in the kitchen. And you can't get them anymore. And mussels were everywhere. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, these are things that in my recent life, not even back when I was 25 years down the road, we do have to be nimble. As a community, we have to realize change is here and we have to be open to creative solutions to keep a working water plan. And from the conservation point of view, you know, those storms, right? We all have seen parts of Brunswick where you just see things sloughing off into the water. So we, in our conservation planning, are really trying to look further back, as I mentioned before, because it's just, it's so obvious that the, not just the working waterfront, but all of our waterfront is not going to be as prepared as in the past. So, and that's hard for people, right? Change is hard. <laughs> so we see things in public realm and public policy and public discussions where people are, you know, anxious because change makes people anxious. I'd also just say though, like with the land, you know, so we're losing bits. And I think some people have this image of protect the coastline. We want to freeze it in time, like it'll never change. But a lot of the coastline is made to ebb and flow Ooh. over time. And so freezing it is not necessarily conserving it in its, its form. But I think the muscles going, and we have to realize that we can, from a standpoint, do everything we can do and still beyond our ability to preserve. So we just, that's part of the planning. Yeah. I get a question. So, well, it's not really a question, a statement. Um, <laughs> Two different things. <laughs> you have the floor. You had me and then you lost me. So uh, Marco brings up a good point about ecosystem stabilization. Um, we're in a uh, biological uh, diversity crisis right now. Um, and because of the changes in climates, it's similar to, in my mind, it's similar to if you're a gardener, you think of the different zones, right? And those zones are on a creek and every marine species is acclimated to certain zones. And, and so when those zones start to change, you see, see invasive species and, and a change in species. So how do we as a state and in the government and the public address those changes so that we maintain a healthy ecosystem that provides um, diversity. So, you know, those, those are really long range planning efforts in terms of having to use science and biology and put those things together and sort of figure out that trajectory. Um, you know, what species are gonna be here in 50 years? We should know that now. Yeah. <laughs> what, you know, where are we, you know, where is the waterfront going to change? Where are we going to see the salt marshes start to migrate as the sea level rises? So that I think is a, a real important part to the, at least the near shore fisheries. Yeah, I agree. And I think that in regards to looking at it from a commercial fishing perspective, there's two different things. One is, you know, it's also resiliency in their businesses and allowing to be nimble and adapt, um, which is not easy in commercial fishing yeah. <laughs> at all. <laughs> And it's also incredibly expensive. Um, and then I think for fishermen too, with climate change, one of their other threats that we don't talk about is just the rapidly changing weather patterns that are happening in the Gulf of Maine and the difficulty and predictability of weather that's happening um, that has changed just in the past decade um, dramatically. It's, um, you know, they, they go out to sea because they know great day and the weather changes like that that's, that's putting their lives at risk um unfortunately so that's definitely something that we we'll keep an eye on too so we had a question from zoom um and i'm going to expand it so the question is what can citizens do to preserve water quality for our fisheries but you know maybe we can also add you know 
how can you help support the ocean, the ecosystem, even support like the waterfront businesses, consumers and citizens be doing? Yeah, read Scuttlebutt. Is it good? <laughs> and then hand it out. Yeah. And Brunswick sort of similar type of Waters Commission puts out has got in the last page or two, it's got some basic common sense information about what to do around home because that's all going to end up in the announcements. I'll send out okay. after this um, a follow up with resources, and I can include a link to that because we don't have copies of it here tonight. But I can do that. One of the things I think people can do when they're out on their boat, <laughs> friends of Casco Bay do a water monitoring program and they have an app and you just see something unusual, see something different than normal, um, all around the water, uh, the level of the tide, take a picture of it on that app. It's almost like Instagram for water reporters and send it in and they track all these changes all over the place. And I mean, I think that's, that's, cool. I didn't know that's that. really cool. And I thought I thought my my customers would jump right on that, and everyone's kind of like, eh, I don't know. But it's really important if people could do that because while you're you know you're out on these islands or in front of your own house or whatever, something is different. And last year there was a lot of different stuff in the water, lots of different patterns, lots of different colors, lots of different organisms. So they could track how far up the bay they were, you know, how large the you know, the, or what the color was. So, I mean, I definitely think if you're someone who is on the bay in a kayak, um, you know, or in a boat, you're fishing on the bay, you know, add that to it. I've got a, a recommendation. Go for it. <laughs> it's not look up for fertilizers and pesticides and herbicides on our lawns. Period. <laughs> Just give up. <laughs> on. If I could just accent what Linda said and how important those types of observations are, because um, unfortunately, I, I do not have my own road. I don't get out on the water. I, I'm part of the majority of, of Brunswick and that I, I rely on someone I know to take me out on the water. And, um, and so having those observations for everyone to see is super helpful. A really good point too. I think also Brunswick has a lot of opportunities for citizens to get involved in um, managing our coastal waters and working waterfronts. So if you're interested, go to the town's website. There's lots of committees and commissions. Uh, there's nonprofit. There's a mind caring about this work. We all need volunteers. We all need support. We can't do our work without the support of citizens. Um, and there's just a great opportunity to do that. So if you care about it and you're feeling frustrated or concerned, I feel like getting involved and doing something, you know, doing a cleanup day or volunteering for a town committee does make you feel better. You feel more informed and you feel like you're taking action, which I think um, helps. Absolutely. I, I just, first of all, I want to uh, thank this, this panel. I know several of you on the panel and, and the discussion has been really good. The location of this panel right now is really interesting because we're sitting at head of tide where it runs right up to the Great Falls, it was called now, and think of it as the Brunswick Dam. So you're 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 thinking about what you know, how do we be nimble and kind of way forward? Well, the um, <clears throat> this dam is is coming up for relicensing under the Federal Energy and Regulatory Commission in 2029. And part of that, the studies that will go into that is how well does fish passage work. When you start thinking about fish passage, it's not just about shad and alewives. Uh, it's not just about salmon. Um, and those are very important species, uh, not only as a food source, um, but also as bait and other things. So um, I just wanted to, to note that here's where we sit, and we're right at the head of time. And this is something that you just kind of have to look over the horizon on. It's a five year process to get to that start of that relicensing, but it is integral to the overall health of the coast from the New Hampshire border all the way out. Thanks for that opportunity to say that. Did I, was it my imagination or, or did I see that the town of Brunswick 
was going to limit the use of pesticides, at least a lot. Then, sir, what, what happened with that? No, ours is ours is twenty five feet in Harpswell, which is just hilarious. <laughs> 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 Yeah, Why? <laughs> oh, we're on the islands too, and it's like this. Yeah, yeah. It's a start, right? So I, I don't know about Brunswick. Does anybody? Um, they're working on it. They're going to do a. Um, uh, they wanted to do a softer approach and educate landowners first. Um, and uh, <laughs> wasn't wasn't any of uh, the committee's choices. Uh, so they're going to do a landscaping. Um, offer some landscaping. Uh, education, um, uh, but ultimately they're gonna probably try to implement that. But the, the chairman of the Marine Resources Committee has been writing, he, I think he's wrote two letters now to the planning department to beg and plead with them, particularly after last year's huge, huge and elongated yeah. algal bloom that we had in, in yeah. the Boyd Middle Bay. And I think it was all throughout Pasco Bay actually. Yeah. Well, we don't necessarily like to talk about this, but lobsters are bugs. And so if it's killing <laughs> bugs in your lawn, it's yeah. actually that it's killing other types of bugs in the water. Yeah, I just wanted to say that I work for Friends of Casco Bay. And so if anyone has any questions on Water Reporter, thank you for the shout out. Right um, it's a really great program and we're really trying to expand it right now. So feel free to come chat with me after if you want. And I can give you some link or something if you wanted to send out. Got it. I'm a water reporter. Beautiful. I'll send it out. But thank you for yeah. saying that. Yeah, the other you. thing that they do is in the, I think it was in the fall, they do a kind of like a state of the bay. Mm -hmm. And although I'm, again, don't, it's it's kind of like a scientific report of the bay. And I thought, oh, I'll just listen to it. You know, it's maybe not my thing. I was amazed at the information that came out of that. And that's maybe just a mailing list you have to get on. You know, um, or just, you know, if it's at the same time every year. Yeah, usually. Yeah. But, you know, you, I just jumped on by Zoom and listened to the whole thing. And, and I think you can see it if you go to their website. Yeah, it should, they have a YouTube channel, yeah. so it should be on there. You can probably just Google it. Yeah, yeah I thought it was website. fascinating. Yeah. So. You can send that out, too. And, and I think Gulf of Maine Research Institute has a prison science section on their website. That's good ways to get involved. I want to put a Earth, uh, Earth Day. Earth Day. Day. Yep. It's Saturday, April 22nd. So save a bug, pick up trash. Did you just come up with that, or is that their slogan? <laughs> That's my slogan. <laughs> I think you'll find that there are places um, uh, around yeah. Brunswick that yeah. are needing to, to yeah. clean up the bay. I think Mayor Point is, at least our company is spearheading a, a program on that. Yeah, they clean up. Uh, just to Marco, to your, your comment earlier about access to the inner title, um, there is a movement afoot to, to deal with that. We're the lawyers bringing that case. You know, we're trying to uh, we're trying to fight to bring the inner title back to the state. Well, we'll talk to you after. Wow. <laughs> it, it was just such a pronounced, like I never knew because I grew up here and then I went away where like anybody could just walk on the shore and it was such a a moment, and now that I've come back, you know, I, I want that. It's gotten worse since you know since when you went away and you came back, and it's gotten worse. It gets worse every day. Hard to do something. Good luck. <laughs> 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 Thank you, sir. Um, I just All wanted right. to plug to. I'm not great at this. It's an initiative. It's friends of Casco Base here too. There's um, MCFA, Ida and front main island trail association and friends of casco bay and the main marine trades association have a <laughs> hashtag campaign called love made water so you can if you are posting pictures you can post it in their app but also if you're putting stuff on instagram and hashtag love made waters we're trying to build that up as a way to get everybody thinking about their relationship with the water a little bit more <laughs> Get more people to come to Maine. Never mind. Yeah, right. <laughs> Give us your money and then go. <laughs> Perfect. All right. Um, okay, so this is a fun question we like to ask people as we start to wrap things up. But do you have a favorite waterfront spot in the area and why? One that you're willing to share to talk about. <laughs> With that smile. Yeah, not everybody. <laughs> 
I have one. Okay. And it's funny to say because the former landowner is in the room. <laughs> <laughs> if you've not been there, there's about two miles of water frontage. There are very few places in Brunswick that you can get out and really have a long walk along the water. Um, and uh, the land trust, in partnership with Maine Coast Heritage Trust and the landowners, Andy, um, we were able to conserve that a couple of years ago. And if you haven't been, I highly recommend it. It's lovely in all seasons. <laughs> it says probably one of my, that's, that's my favorite too. And, and I, when I first heard about that, I was like, no way, that can't be. <laughs> yeah, it's almost too good to be true, but it's a fantastic place. So thank you so much. Yeah. Up until then, my plants would have been a place I can access the water. It's my favorite water plant. So when I was, one time I was taking my kids to Harpswell to one of your beaches. It seems like oh, Brunswick doesn't have any coastline. And I had to, uh, you know, and, but I mean, that's pointing that up until a later age, he didn't realize Brunswick had a coastline. It's hidden, it's hidden right? And we do have like, some hidden. I think a lot of people um, don't think of Brunswick as being a coastal town. Yeah. And if you, you know, if any, anyone who comes through as, um, as a, a tourist or whatever coming in, they come into the downtown, which is great, but then they never, I mean, I can't tell you how many people will come in and be like, my God, I've lived here 50 years, never knew this was here, you know? So we being one of the best kept secrets down there, but also, I mean, we get a lot of, you know, a lot of, we try to catch a lot of the tourists kind of coming from Freeport to see something else besides, um, not besides just downtown, I don't mean that, but to see another part of Brunswick. So, my favorite place on the bay, I don't know, it's funny, I spent 12 hours a day looking at the bay. <laughs> so, so, my favorite place on the bay is inland. No. Um, <laughs> I think probably my favorite place on the bay is actually just to get in the boat and to leave the marina and to just ride around, go down around the Goose Islands, go down around whale boat, just to see the lobster buoys and see the sunset and just to see, just to really appreciate the islands at Casco Bay. It's what makes it, you sit on the beach in Virginia Beach for many years and you look out over nothing. And then you come up here and you look on, you know, you sit on the, just the, the lawn of someone's house or at the boat launch, or whatever, and you see the islands, there is nothing like it than just out there, out and looking at the islands. I can't tell you my favorite spot. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, about your like second, but where's your like favorite recreational spot? Like just for looking at the water, if you have one. It could be in Harpswell too. That's fine. Yeah, I was. I I, I could actually. Um, I was. I was out. Um, I do some wild harvest of uh, European oysters and um, scuba diving, and I was doing that this winter, and um, just diving out and around. Um, the further out you get, the just the clearer and more beautiful the, the water gets. And I was. I was over by place that I can't really say. <laughs> it was it was out there. Um, and no, I could say I could say Ash Point, Harpswell. And um, it was uh, just so beautiful. The colors were just amazing. Um, it's underwater right there. Um, so yeah. Did you have a question? Oh, okay. I thought you had raised your hand. I was just gonna say Angela uh, That beautiful, um, you know, tidal, heavy fresh water. It's one of my favorites. Yeah. <laughs> Anybody in the audience want to? There's some new preserves on uh, the backside of Birch Island. Old tides, oh, but yeah. there's this this one that's always been my favorite anyway. But it got. Now you're allowed to go there. Now I'm. <laughs> now it's legal. <laughs> Uh, it's basically on the other side of Birch from where the marina is. It's Ford's Beach. It's traditionally called Ford's Beach. It's a yeah. little cove 
Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. And there's a point in the last private uh, landowner put a uh, iron wharf that he was going to do, but now it's been preserved, mm -hmm. and it's not just a, a perfect cove because it's it's a it's a former Native American summering spot, so there's actually mm -hmm. a building there that did not touch. Mm -hmm. um, but there's now an eagle's nest. Um, Patsy and I found it. We were kayaking around, and we went in our favorite cove there. And uh, oh my God, there's these gargantuan fledglings <laughs> on this brand new eagle's nest. Just, and uh, in autumn, if you there's a trail, you can go. It's public. Part of it is public. And the goldenrod, if you can handle the goldenrod. Yeah. <laughs> Stand. It's beautiful. That sounds wonderful. Can anybody give me a ride? <laughs> <laughs> so my, my point is, though, it's, well, it's super important to preserve those those places, not just from seeing it for a visit, but from the ecosystem standpoint too. But you know, someone that just wants to grab their kids and take them to the water that doesn't have a boat, so we're really limited. To those <coughs> and so when we're thinking about where do you conserve? I would just hope that's a, a factor in the equation to how many, how, what percentage of the population is actually going to be able to participate in this spot? Will you have parking? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's we hugely important. A lot about parking <laughs> and dogs at the land trust. Yes. <laughs> I'm good for both. But parking is very important because all those people that want to access the water want to park somewhere. Yeah. And when so you have true. nowhere to park, they right. start looking for other places. Yeah. So, right. And one other thing that we're going to start talking about at the RCWC is those places, many of them are accessible to someone who has a mobility issue, who can yeah. get down there, whether they're, whether they need a device assistance or whether they just need a more of a stable place. So realistically, there's, there's that demographic that that's Last question from the audience. Thoughts from the panel. Um, if not, we might wrap up a few minutes early, and I would encourage. There was a hand. Oh, go ahead. Just, just a comment in terms of accessibility. Woodward Point will have an accessible trail open in the spring. It's three quarters of the way done, and we can manage to finish it. Yeah. It will be. I think Herbsville has a trail. But the yeah. cliff trail. Yep. We're at MCHT, and I know MCHT is an ally. Anybody here talk about MCHT's commitment to what the subject is? <laughs> as long as we're here. The staff member here. Yeah, What's the question? Well, it's just MCHT's role in this subject. Um, I, I know is a positive. Right. Um, and everybody we, might know. You have Jeremy Gabrielson, who is involved in uh, planning all up and down the coast. Um, we have, uh, you know, of course, our, our primary goal is protecting uh, more natural spaces, but uh, we have some have done some really cool projects down east where we've provided access um, to towns. That didn't have any where the fishermen didn't have any access. So we're certainly looking at you know ways that we can do that. And sometimes it's not buying the property, but it might be providing technical assistance or helping with funding, um, so that towns can can do that uh, with our help. I I think Angela touched on a lot of the issues that Maine Coast Heritage Trust focuses on um, in terms of Jeremy's work in identifying properties that would be appropriate, you know, and then trying to understand the needs of the communities. Uh, there was one project where we bought a half an acre strip just to provide a couple of parking places so that people could get to the boat launch. So there are all these, and this sort of gets to my question, but there are all of these competing interests and needs and 
I wear a ton of different hats. And so listening to your conversation today has made my head spin. Uh, I'm a landowner, you know, in Brunswick. So I pay those property taxes. I sit in my office window and I watch the clamors break over our cove three and four times, sometimes a day. But and I just want to be like, dudes, they've already come through today. Like come back tomorrow. And, you know, so the relationships and the tensions that everybody's interests, you know, everybody has a valid interest to access and utilize our resources in our coast. And yet you've got to figure out how to balance those. And so how do you, what do you see as the most effective ways to do that? And I'll tell you when somebody said pivoting and being laid on their feet and adapting to changes, the airboat issue come to Brunswick. And it's, it's a big deal because we now have airboats, which we didn't used to have, ripping up and down in front of our, our house a few times a day, tying up to our dock. You know, it's not a big deal for us, but it is for other people. So, you know, we all play a, a part in this dynamic, but how do we educate potential landowners to you know, buy a property in the middle of a duck hunting area? Or, you know, work with the clamors, you know, I don't know who did it, but somebody lit a piece of our property on fire by using it without act, without permission. You know, to the other clamors who whose boat broke down and they were just looking to get down into the cove. And I said, if you're willing to walk up and down the hill, you know, have at it. So it's unique. So what do you see as being effective in helping to work those relationships or the biggest, you know, detractors in preventing them from being healthy relationships? I can I can probably speak to that. Um, I think the, the land trust could serve as a liaison, where the where the clam harvester might not necessarily um, know, you know, maybe one clam clam harvester doesn't you know represent the whole you know body of clam harvesters in town, um, and so instead of having that one harvester going and talk to the land landowner um, maybe you can have you know, the land trust you know send someone and you know talk about um, or um, agreement that, that could be made um, regarding the use of the, the land you know um, for you know accessing the mud flat um, now in, to the airboat you know question I think that you know that it's, it's a really difficult um, and I think that there's a lot of movement right now going on in the state and in the town. Um, and I, I, I think that, that it will end up getting sorted out. There will be some, some regulation on it, um, but it is a new technology um, that is you know, figure out how to manage. Does regulation equal compromise to you? I think so. I think what you just said is important. I think it's, in, it's educating each other. So you as a landowner have an opportunity to speak, maybe even like in a public hearing type of sense where you have an opportunity to just say the simple things that you just said tonight and for the clamors to be able to say, or the harvesters to be able to say, well, you know, you have a strip of land that we accessed for 50 years and now we can't access that. And I think a lot of people don't understand that the harvesters used to access the water in other ways, and now they can't access in the ways on those paper streets that they traditionally accessed. And so they have to adapt. And, and this is boat. how they adapted. You know, if, if we could access you how know? we used to be able to, um, we wouldn't have to use the airboats as much. Yeah. So, I mean, instead of having- 50, so, I don't yeah. even know how much an airboat costs. <sighs> I can't imagine, but if it's anything like the cost of a pickup truck right now, it's probably a lot more than that. But I'm sure that that is not the first thing they wanted to do is go out and buy that. I always think of it as like a bus going by, it's filled with climbers, they go down, yeah. they come back. It doesn't directly affect me as much because they stay quite a ways on the outside of the mooring field. But, you know, maybe just a community forum where you guys have the opportunity to. Yeah, I, I, you know, I know our stewards at Maine Coast Heritage Trust spend a lot of time talking with fishermen, climbers, and uh, it's sometimes those can be difficult conversations, to be honest. There's 
commodity futures mix, but I think having those conversations um, regularly and not giving up on them is so important. Um, I don't think we have anyone from HARPS here tonight, um, but you know, I know Harpswell and Maine Coast Heritage Trust, um, when we can work with a landowner or the town to preserve that traditional access, that is a high priority for all coastal land trusts. It's a high priority for us, and we've been in communications over the years with Dan, Clammers, and others to get a map out and say these are the places where we have access, where we to have access where access is threatened and we try you know you're not always successful but we've been successful and you know we're still working on that but you know things are changing and we get together again and say there probably are other access points and i think as the houses turn over too i mean the, the new owners didn't they didn't know that there used to be a paper street there that people used to access through there they wouldn't be flexible with it but you never know maybe they would be if they knew that was for 50 years that was an access point point. and when you land is changing hands like that's when it's a real opportunity to try to put an access easement on something yeah. so ideally we would get to them before yeah, the mayor point road used to be filled with cars on the side of the road going down to dig and now maybe yeah maybe one or two spots but airboats Mm -hmm. All right. If anybody wanted to follow the airboat issue, that there were meetings, a lot of meetings. Yeah. Uh, last year, IFMW had I think three meetings that I don't know if the I don't know if the recordings are available online, but we were able to access. A, a number of us did from the Marine Resources Committee, and, and the committee does get updates from Dan Sylvain, who's our harbor master. And so, if you look at the Marine Resource Committee agendas. Uh, Harbor Master Report, you see it as an, an item, and he will sort of give an update of you know, what happened at the latest meeting, which is the last one from here two weeks ago, where they talked about potential future, future states. And so you can you can find out that way. But the airboats is a great example of a symptom of loss of access because that's been the big driver. And for the record. I was a clamor. I would totally want to use an airboat <laughs> <laughs> instead of hauling those bags all over Hampton Come. So, but there's you know conversation and compromise in terms of when and how, <laughs> what you're doing with it, what the potential ecosystem ramifications are, and community relations. I mean, it's all you <laughs> happy. I'd say the, the the dumpsters that I can hear being emptied from my house. That's always at 5 a.m. You know, I don't have the luxury of tie where sometimes that's a, a, a very similar decibel level. Yes. So, you know, I think we got to talk about what I last year finally broke down and bought a, a leaf blower, which I said I never would. But uh, <laughs> the decibel levels on those things, it's a rechargeable. <laughs> the decibel levels on those, it's a seed. On so that note. <laughs> so, I mean, there's a lot, it's a bigger issue. That, that, no, I got to get myself through still. Uh, on that note, you, that, I mean, that's one of the many reasons that we do these panels. We've done them in Kennebunkport, uh, Freeport, Brunswick. Um, we started out in Harpswell. We should be missing anybody. Yeah. And we partner with land trusts to host them for this exact reason is to make that connection. Um, and it's why we built Scuttlebutt. It's, we also have something called the Working Waterfront Inventory Template for municipalities mm -hmm. to be able to inventory their working waterfront infrastructure and give them a foundation of metrics so that they can track change over time in their community. I think the thing that we need to remember is it's not a, there's no magic pill that we can take and you need a lot more than just a wrench in your toolbox. We need a lot of tools in our toolbox to be able to, um, solve some of the issues that we're talking about tonight, whether it's climate change, access, um, there's a whole bunch of other obstacles around the working waterfront that we didn't even get to tonight and in commercial fishing as well. So um, I just wanna thank Brunswick Thompson Land Trust and make this press being our partners in this evening. I wanna thank all of you for joining us. I had a lot of fun, I hope you did too. Um, please try some Maine Coast Monkfish stew. There's also some delicious crackers and cheese. Um, there's copies of Scuttlebutt and some other information over on the table over there. 
Um, and Susan will be sending around an email with some resources. If you don't belong to any of our newsletters, sign up our newsletters, visit Bob Marina this summer, um, and have a wonderful evening. Thank you. Thank you. these wonderful groups. <laughs>